Made possible by the Carnegie Council, the voice for ethics in international affairs. Today our speaker is Peter Godwin and he'll be discussing his latest book, The Fear, Robert Mugabe and the Martyrdom of Zimbabwe. Should we view longtime Zimbabwe dictator Robert Mugabe as consistently unethical or as a liberator whose tyrannical character emerged over the course of his time in power? We now present author and journalist Peter Godwin. If I, if I canvassed the room, it would be that Zimbabwe went through this great um, uh, year or so, a decade or so, and that sometime really in the late 90s, you know, he has a sudden r rush of blood to the head. If he were doing this as a Hollywood script, the sort of trajectory would be that, you know, it, was, it would be good leader turned, turns bad, you know, and, and that, that he would be the liberation leader who then reconciles with everybody and is, you know, a very, very um, uh, magnanimous, a uh, country's a great success, and then sometime in the late 90s, he has a sudden rush of blood to the head with, with the factors being his steady, cautious Ghanaian wife, Sally, has in the meantime died, been on kidney dialysis and she dies that um that he uh, you know he he gets older and loses advisors that south africa change that he's you know there's a certain amount of jealousy on his part when mandela emerges for example and and there certainly is i mean you should if you go back and i i've looked at gone back and looked at some of the newsreels and things and <laughs> whenever if you see there are shots where you see mugabe in the same lineup, or you know, interacting with Mandela, and Mugabe looks as though he's smelt a bad smell. He's sort of always, you know, he's just so he can't, you know, he's so palpably irritated and jealous by Mandela's appearance. And Mandela, you know, I'm, I've interviewed Mandela on several occasions, and he admits as as much. In fact, he he cracked a wonderful joke about it. He said, "Mugabe was the star, and then the sun came out." <laughs> it's just. <laughs> And you know what happens to the stars when the sun comes out. Um, so there's, there's, you know, that these factors somehow played into a kind of psychological degeneration or psychological change in Mugabe's makeup, and he and becomes more authoritarian. Um, and that's the general, generally accepted conventional wisdom for what happened in Zimbabwe. But there's one problem with all of this. It, <laughs> It doesn't stand up to any real chronology, and that was been my problem with it all the way along. And um, it, which is that I was one of the people who went back to Zimbabwe in 1980. We were the Rainbow Nation before South Africa became that. We were all a lot of white liberals, so-called, returned in 1980 because Mugabe put out this APB and said, "Come back and help." He didn't just say it to the farmers; he said it to all of us. So we thought, fantastic. So we all went back, and there was this uh, diaspora that came back, black and white, and Indian and colored. No, all of it went back because we and. And for a couple of years, it was it seemed amazing. Although you know, now that I look at even those early times, you realized how much you were sort of, you know, you were damping down your critical powers because you wanted it to succeed so much. And that's one of these sort of, you know, irritating aspects is that often the people who know most about a country are the people who are most emotionally involved and therefore whose advice is least reliable <laughs> because they want to sort of take the facts they want to cherry pick the facts to end up with the good results I mean it's you know I think you come to a, a real conclusion not just by one leap but by hundreds and hundreds of little binary calculations that you're making all the way but if you're constantly taking the one instead of the zero you end up with that and I, I'm faced that situation in South Africa at the moment where you know I wanted to succeed but the, 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 the more honest I am about the, those little binaries the more I realize that more of them are, are turning up zeros instead of ones. Mugabe is not as other dictators. He is an extremely educated man. I think at last count he had six postgraduate uh, degrees. He is an, actually, a, I think, m much more than I am, a public intellectual. Um, uh, and he is an oddly fastidious dictator. He's not sort of of the ilk of Idi Amin, the heavyweight champion of boxing champion of the King's African Rifles, or even some Nigerian general with medals strewn across their shoulders. And Mugabe, you know, was a liberator. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. He served his dues. He was 11 years in prison under Ian Smith. He then, you know, he, he, he then headed up his organization, ZANU, in exile during a during a bush war that that took six or seven years at, at its most um, and 
And in 1980, when Mugabe came back in from exile and Zimbabwe had its first uh, free and fair elections where, where all races and, and genders indeed could vote, um, uh, he won an overwhelming mandate. And, and at that point, if you bear in mind, we were still in the middle of the Cold War, um, the, there was a huge sigh of relief in the West when Mugabe turned out not to be what we thought. He, wasn't, he didn't turn out to be a communist. He didn't turn out to be bent on racial ven vendettas. Um, he made an astonishingly reconciliatory speech in 1980. He reached out to the white farmers, who frankly, most of, most of whom I was there at the time, were getting ready to leave. They were, they were you know, packing up and going because they thought they, their goose was well and truly cooked. And not only did he ask them um, to stay, he said, if you want to, if you, you know, he, he, he pleaded with them. I mean, he appealed to them and said, if you want to contribute to the new Zimbabwe, this is what I want you to do. Go back to your farms and produce food. I want you to feed not only Zimbabwe, but the region. And that's how we can do this. This is a very important point, by the way, um, because the land issue has become the primary, um, the, the primary uh, aspect of spin for Mugabe. The way the Zimbabwe story has been told you often you would be forgiven for thinking that it's that that one of the primary aspects of it has been the matter of land inequality because that's what it looks like because if you read the the press if you if, if you absorb the media we tend to the international media only tends to get interested in zimbabwe when white people are involved it's quite interesting it's there's a racial element to the way that we we look at africa so it's one of the reasons that apartheid was such a preeminent story. It was the perfect story because it, it literally was color-coded. You could explain it to a child. I mean, it, it's basic things. And you had whites behaving badly. So it was, you know, you had, you had all, you know, all these perfect elements of a story. Other stories that tend to get, are very undercovered in Africa. Congo, who even understands it? Because you just have... You know, you have tribes and you have different African groups, black African groups, and it's very hard for foreign audiences to, to figure out the arcane minutiae of it. So Z Mugabe knows this, um, and so he, he, he's played up the, the land issue, because there is a land issue in Zimbabwe. There absolutely is a land issue. You know, a disproportionate amount of land was held by white farmers. Absolutely no doubt about that. There was a historical inequity. But in 1980, it seems to me at least, I mean, I would posit this, that if you have a, a democratically elected leader who you know, is, is put there by an overwhelming mandate, who at that point says to a group of white farmers, this is what I want you to do in the name of the Zimbabwean people. I want you to stay and I want you to farm. It seems to me at least that at that point, you have a social contract. You have something that, that, that supersedes the original inequality at least for the time being. Now, and so the, the white farmers did stay, and they were very productive, and they got wealthy, and in fact, many of them supported Mugabe and his party and helped to fund him, which is something you don't read much about. Um, if you fast forward uh, to 2000, when he starts to finally move against the farmers, uh, you, again, you would be forgiven for thinking this is a primarily racial thing, that he feels that the, that the whites have withdrawn their support from him, that they are helping the opposition in some ways, that they're helping to fund the opposition even. Um, and so he's decided to get rid of them. In fact, his real target, interestingly enough, and again, you won't read mu this a lot in the, in the media, his real target at that time are the um, 500,000 black farm workers, most of whom are members of GAPWAS, which is a, a, un, a farm workers union, and are supporting the opposition. They're the biggest single voting bloc that's voting against him. And what he wants to do is, get, is, is break them up and get them off the farms. Now, for various h historical reasons, many of those black farm workers, um, th their families came to Zimbabwe three or four generations ago from neighboring states to work on those farms. So many of them originally were from Malawi or, 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 or Zambia or Mozambique in particular. Um, and so what he does is he also at the same time passes legislation to disenfranchise them. It's a, it's a very curious piece of legislation that a lot of us got caught up in, in which says, and I think it's probably illegal anyway, it says that if you have the right 
to another nationality, even if you've never taken it up. In other words, if one of your parents, or in some cases grandparents, was born in another country that would accept that as a, um, a claim to nationality of that country, you automatically lose your Zimbabwean, certainly your right to vote, but your nationality, unless you can... <laughs> can produce a letter from the embassy of that country saying that you no longer want to be, you, you want to ever claim that right in the future. Now, in practical terms, it was almost impossible to, to, to do that. I mean, we, we all, a lot of us tried to do it, but the extraordinary thing would happen, for example, if you, if, as in my case, my, my parent, my mother was born in England, so I had a right to a British passport. In fact, I had a British passport. You were supposed to return the British passport to the British embassy, and they were supposed to give you a letter saying, we hate you, you can never be a Brit again, you know, I spit on the Queen, or whatever, you know, that was it. And I'm not going to the royal wedding, if, even if I was invited. Um, uh, and then you're supposed to present that to the Zimbabwean home affairs people who would then give you a passport. Now, of course, if you read on the inside of any passport, the British passport included, it says that the passport is the property of, the, of that embassy. So the, under international protocol, the Zimbabweans then have to take that passport and give it to the British Embassy, who then <laughs> return it to you. So there was a sort of ridiculous merry-go-round. That, um, but the but the but the real purpose about behind the the, the farm um, the original farm attacks was that the reason Mugabe moved on it, it, you know, the reason that it all went bad in 2000 for Mugabe was that he had uh, a bit like Bloomberg, I suppose, he'd run out of his term limits. Um, so uh, and and he needed to fix that by passing a new constitution. Um, so there was a referendum on that, which they had become just blasé. They basically, the government had got more and more authoritarian. There was, there'd been no opposition at all. And I'll go back in a minute as to how that happened. And so they just didn't prepare properly. And they were completely blindsided when they lost the referendum. They hadn't even bothered to put in place the normal cheating mechanisms because they, they'd been told there was really no problem. And so suddenly this thing spun out of control. In fact, he, he ignored it and moved on and changed the constitution anyway and one thing. But that, that, was, that was the beginning of this kind of uh, d this last 10 years of, of destruction. Now, what's, what's interesting, if you go back to 1980, so there's Mugabe, he's come in, the things we're scared of, that he'd nationalize everything, that he'd be mean to the whites, that he would be pro-communist, none of these came to pass. And so the West thought, great, he's in our camp, he's one of ours. Again, it's worth remembering when we look at dictators in Africa in particular, let's just take Africa, I've covered a lot of them, as I said, and, and there's a, you know, they are primarily to blame for their own actions, there's no doubt about that. But we in the international community, and indeed in the West probably more than anywhere else, have our fair share of contributory, contributory sorry, blame, um, which is that if you take Africa as a continent, I mean, first of all, without going back to the Congress of Berlin and everything where we divide the country up into these bizarre states which bear no relation, aren't organic at all, and some of them aren't nations, other, others of them can't possibly be working economic entities on their own. Um, so many of them have lumped together mutually antagonistic um, tribes. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why, reasons for ongoing African instability that still have their origins in colonialism and indeed in the map of Africa. Th there's also the fact that uh, from 1957, which is when sub-Saharan Africa begins to be independent. It, it, Ghana in 1957 is the first one. Um, we're already deep into the Cold War. The Cold War has essentially started with the end of the Second World War, even before we, we now realize. Um, and so from the very beginning, the, the message that we in, in the West and indeed in the East send to this nascent group of African leaders who for the first time are becoming national leaders of independent African countries, most of which didn't exist in their current shape before that, um, is we're not over bothered by whether you're democratic or not. We're not even that fussed about human rights. Here's what we care about. We care about whether you're in our camp or their camp. Are you pro-Moscow or are you pro-Washington? Are you communist or are you free enterprise and whatever? That's really the defining thing. And as long as you stay on the right side of that, you know, you'll get you'll get support from us. You'll get aid. You'll get investment. You'll get whatever's necessary. Right up until 1990, that's the way the game is played. And suddenly, in 1990, the Berlin Wall comes down. The Cold War's over, 
And we turn around to this group of African leaders who since 1957, you know, since they existed as leaders, have been used to one way of operating and say, "Uh uh-oh, the the rules of the international game changed entirely. Now, if you want aid, you want to qualify for aid and to be in our our good, you know, international, our good books economically and everything else, we want this thing called democracy, we want transparency, we don't want corruption, we want open society, we want this. And there's this whole, you know, whole roster of things that we've never been fussy about before. So we help to condition those entire first generations of African leaders in that binary world view. And that's that so so it's not like we can sit on our hands and say and say, tut tut Africa, what a mess. Do you you know, we 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 are also we play into why it's such a mess. I mean I got the first hint that Matabilan, the south of the country, there was a, there was something going on there, and I snuck in there. And what it turned out to be was the Matabilan massacres, which the military oper- operational name for was Gukura Hundi, which means the rains that wash away the the sort of rubbish. Um, and we now, to the best of our ability, think that probably twenty thousand civilians were killed in that. Now, bear in mind, this was nineteen eighty three. This was in our, isn't Zimbabwe happy, shiny, smiley people, lots of full stomachs phase. And there's 20,000 people killed. But guess what? They're black people and they're killed by other black people. And I wrote about it on the front page. It it did end up on the front page of the paper. I then principally worked for the London Sunday Times. We ran a series of three articles. We had pictures. We had, I I had eyewitness accounts. I, I was an eyewitness myself. Nothing. In the UN, nothing. No demarches, no, nothing happened to him because he was still on our side. He was being nice to whites. Zimbabwe was a success story. We can be very selective in what we want to see. And we, right then, that wasn't the narrative. That wasn't the trajectory we wanted. So we just ignored it. And that, it seems to me, you sow the seeds there. As you sow, you shall reap. We sowed the seeds there by saying, you know what? You can kill 20,000 people. It's survivable politically, internationally. He went on. After that, he got dozens of, of honorary doctorates from very good universities, including Edinburgh University. He got knighted by the Queen, I think, in 1990 for services to Zimbabwe-British relations. Um, he got all sorts of international accolades after his North Korean-trained 5th Brigade had killed 20,000 civilians. Now, I mean, much later on, I you know, got into f- furious... Um, uh, public row with 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 Edinburgh University when when I, I wrote a, a, an editorial in the London Times saying this is ridiculous that he st- I realized he still had this we've taken away his knighthood but he still had this honorary degree I said how can Edinburgh has still uh, you know have given them this honorary doctorate and then so they so they took it away but then in the letter that they as they withdrew it they said they they tried to say that well we didn't know at the time and it was I said it was on the it was all hidden nobody knew I said it was on the front pages of the bloody newspapers it wasn't you didn't have to be some arcane researcher to dig it up oh no we I said you're a university I mean so I think that you know th- there is this you, you know Mugabe what the the, le- the 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 message we sent to him all this time was. You can get away with this stuff. And indeed, if you even go back, and I, I mean, I, the, the, I'm looking, I, I find that Mugabe has behaved completely consistently throughout his career. What has changed is the world around him. And I think that it behoves us in the international community to be really more, more watchful and to call things as we see them early on. I mean, there are lots of examples now you know, when you, when you look around the world of that of that happening, where you've got leaders that we've been well disposed to, who are starting to to push that way, um, um, and you know, for a long time, people like me were kind of these voices in the wilderness, and people, you know, that if you were against Mugabe, you were you were swimming against the tide. It, it's just interesting, and you know, since ninety nine two thousand. He's now, there's a very large consensus that he is what he is. He's a violent dictator. And, and certainly what I saw in 2008, he looked as though he'd lost that election in 2008. And the reason that he'd lost it, again, was that they had screwed up in a number of crucial ways. Their, their vote rigging and intimidation, whatever, there's nothing subtle about it, even when they're not directly beating people up. They, I mean, you know, they, they control the counting, and whoever controls the counting. I mean, none of it would pass an even very basic audit. One of the reasons it went wrong, by the way, just as a final anecdote, is that the, the, the opposition had brought, there were 9,000 polling stations across the country, many of them in very remote rural areas. The opposition brought in 9,000 
plastic disposable cameras of the kinds that you find scattered around wedding receptions and people take photos of, of each other drunk um, and they end up on YouTube. Um, is that they, um, and they gave these to electoral agents and said, and they, they also got this little concession that the results would be pinned up on the wall. And when the results were pinned up at the wall of each photo, they took a picture of it. And so, and Zana PF suddenly realized what was going on and chased the electoral agents away and stomped on the, you know, on the cameras that they could. But enough pictures had been taken that they couldn't then, you know, it, 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 it cramped their style in, in, in fiddling those results. And that was one of the reasons it, it spun out of control. Another reason was just the sheer turn against Mugabe. They hadn't realized... I mean, you know, the, 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 the opinion polls at the time showed that he probably had about 10% support in the country. So to cheat on that level is also, you know, you, you, you have to be very um, imaginative. So at that point, it did actually look like he was, he was um, going to go. He was, he was 84 at that point, and he suddenly kind of looked like the steam had gone out of him. And, he just, and his wife, oddly, Grace, you know, who's... We've got these pathetic sanctions against Zimbabwe, which are just against 200 of the of the elite, and it, and all that means they can't travel and they can't have foreign bank accounts. But she likes to shop at Harrods and things, and she can't do that. So she sort of thought, well, it's enough now. Let's get some money and 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 and, and change the nature of the game. And I arrived at that moment, and there was this brief two-week period where it looked like he really was going to go. And and in Harare, there was kind of an amazing feeling that. You know, it was it was it was like 1980, um, and then he sat down with his generals, and they kind of discussed it. One of the main reasons that they realized that they couldn't go is actually to do with the nature of 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 international law and how that's changing, and that you know, for, it's it's it, we're in the very early stages of the ICC and all of it, you know, but we're beginning. People, you know, people like Mugabe are ending up in the Hague, and it doesn't matter. The opposition can give you immunity from prosecution locally, but there are more and more ways that you can still be, you know, that you can run, but you can't hide. And in, as, it's, as that nascent section of the law is sort of coming into sight, as we're, we're, we're moving from, from one system to another, one of the, you know, the law of unintended consequences, if you like, is that in the short term, it can end up stiffening the resolve of dictators and their henchmen to stay in power because the alternative is fairly ghastly. So the opposition and, and the diplomats, I mean, and I saw the deals that were being offered to them, index-linked pensions and, and immunity from prosecution locally and that they would be able to keep a farm each and you know they would still have public honours and all that kind of thing. So that they wouldn't be sort of you know down and humiliated and all that because everybody was just desperate to get rid of them. But they realized that none of this was really enforceable. Once you've lost power, you've lost your ability to kind of guarantee any of these things. And so in the end, what they did was launch this uh, astonishing um, campaign of torture, which, 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 then, w which then Mugabe launched in, uh, into. Um, so I will conclude my remarks there, but I'm happy to take questions. What do you see uh, as the future of South African policy towards Zimbabwe? And secondly, do you think it'll be important in what happens in that country? I didn't mention that because I knew someone, thank you for asking that question, because I was relying on someone asking it. It's, it's absolutely key. I mean, South Africa is completely the key to Zimbabwe now, to resolving the Zimbabwe situation, and, and had, has always been. South Africa is still, you know, it's still the regional power, but it also has this you know, overwhelming um, uh, importance to, to Zimbabwe, I beg your pardon. And, and many people are perplexed as to, well, why wouldn't South Africa want Zimbabwe to be democratic? Why, um, um, and, and South Africa, I believe, has behaved shamefully in the Zimbabwe situation. Um, and Thabo Mbeki, I think, provided cover and um, a rationale for M Mugabe's um, uh, continuing in power well after he'd lost support of his own people, of Zimbabwean people. In general, I think what, what, what's happened is that you have this liberation solidarity. So all of the countries in Southern Africa that fought liberation wars, that fought anti-colonial wars, the, the movements that fought those wars that, that you know, were political movements that morphed into, into guerrilla movements that then became incumbent governments are all still in power. So the MPLA in Angola, um, SWAPO in Namibia, 
ZANU-PF in Zimbabwe, FRELIMO in Mozambique, and the ANC in South Africa. They're all still in power. And it's not in the interest of any one of them for any other of them to lose power. Because what it does is it sort of diminishes the liberation aura, the sort of this sense that no one else has a right to rule except we who freed you. And again, that's a sort of Cuban analogy. You see it. If you, if you travel to Zimbabwe, if you read the state media, you would, you know, it feels like the war and liberation happened last week. It's kept very much alive. And it's this sort of, it's this font of holy revolutionary water that you can go back to and dunk yourself in and say, excuse me, say, you know, we, we, are, we rule by, by right. We freed you and therefore we rule, this, in this generation at least. And it's a way that you can, it's a way that you can, delegitimize any opposition. I mean, that's what any, any opposition that emerges in Zimbabwe is always a, a tool of the West, a tool of the whites, a tool of some, because it's, it, it's, it's anti-revolutionary. And you see the same. You, you, know, you could move between Cuba and Zimbabwe in terms of state media, and, and you could interchange the articles. I mean, you wouldn't have to change, change much at all. Um, and you can see Mugabe, you know, you can see how perplexed he is when he's looking at this electorate that, you know, and realizing that they've rejected him in enormous numbers, him saying, how can you vote against me? If it weren't for me, you wouldn't have a vote. That's my reading of it anyway. Well, I thank you so much. And unfortunately, our time is up, but there's so much interest. You have to come back. We hope this program was informative and provided some perspective on the underlying ethical issues. Possible by the Carnegie Council, the voice for ethics in international affairs. For more information, see www.carnegiecouncil.org.